about connectedness or our relationships with other people. Humans are social animals, so it's only natural that we form relationships not just with our family members and friends, but with the wider community. Sure, I mean, everyone needs relationships. In fact, human interaction can become the mainstay of our entire life. Supportive relationships get us through times of change and help us to deal with stress. So, it makes perfect sense that our relationships affect our well-being and our health in either positive or negative ways. Yeah, so today we're here to talk about how we can ensure that our relationships are in fact nurturing and positive. Jonathan Duffy spoke with John Cunningham about how our relationships affect our well-being and ability to cope with life issues. John, do relationships impact on our health? Our relationships are vital to us in a variety of ways, though occasionally we seek professional help for one reason or another. By far the most uh, sharing and caring that we receive in our daily lives comes from those that we feel closest to emotionally. Um, in fact, there was even a public health uh, campaign in California uh, which was organized around the theme that friends are good medicine. I believe that applies to family uh, as well uh, as to friends. Social support can be organized under three different themes. The three A's, in fact, affect, affirmation, and aid. Affect involves things like expressions of liking or respect or love. Affirmation involves uh, feedback to the individual that they are a worthwhile person and about the appropriateness of their actions in one or another situation. And finally, aid refers to such material goods as time, money, services, um, things that help make the lives of other people uh, easier. There are certain times when social support is particularly important. After all, uh, everybody's life involves change. Now, when their lives do change, the routines that they use for getting through life uh, may no longer work. When that happens, people experience stress. It's been shown that family and friends can help to cushion the effect of stress under those particular circumstances through the social support uh, that they provide. That social support can take on at least four different forms. Firstly, they can increase the person's motivation to cope with the particular stressful circumstances. Friends and family may encourage that individual, for example, to hang in there and not give up. Secondly, social support may alter the person's ideas about the problem that they are facing. Uh, for example, through discussion with family and friends, they may suddenly discover solutions to a problem that they previously thought uh, was impossible. Thirdly, social support may have beneficial emotional consequences, such as bolstering self-esteem that's threatened by stressful circumstances and restoring that person's sense of themselves. Fourthly, uh, resources such as money um, may be consumed in stressful circumstances and one social network can act to restore the uh, resources that the person uh, has that have been depleted by those various stressful events. However, I feel that it must be kept in mind that relationships are not always totally a good thing. Though I'm sure that they bring us our greatest joys in life, they can also bring us our greatest sorrows. That is, when there is conflict in our close relationships, that can create a great deal of psychological uh, unhappiness. Um, in fact, in a study that I showed, um, it seemed that married women um, who were concerned about their relationships uh, with their husbands showed the greatest distress of all, uh, more so than their concerns over their work lives or concerns over their children. Our relationships are so important that we need to nurture them often so that we can lead full and satisfying personal lives. Only then can we be all that we hope to be. Having a positive view of ourselves is not the same as being vain. If we are not confident with ourselves, how can we form healthy and supportive relationships with others? Having a good self-view is about being able to feel good about ourselves despite our imperfections. Kitty Fryer believes a good self-view will lead to good relationships and will also improve our well-being. Kitty, how does our self-esteem relate to our overall well-being? 
That's a very important question, and I think it's something that we don't pay enough attention to. Our well-being is really impacted by how we feel about ourselves. It impacts us in terms of how we relate to others. It impacts our health. It impacts, it impacts even our longevity. We know those who are feeling very good about themselves live longer lives. We know that those who um, have cancers or AIDS or other illnesses who feel very good about themselves also seem to be more resilient to the disease. So it's something that's very core to who we are as humans and does affect where we will go, how healthy we will be, how happy we will be. Um, it will affect our successes, our goals, what we will reach. All of those things become really important in that. So is self-esteem something that we can learn as an adult or is it something that's either acquired or not acquired in childhood? Well, we do know it is acquired in childhood, and we do know that our um, parents or our caregivers are very important in the development of self-esteem and self-concept in children. And as we grow up, those around us who are important to us do influence that. But my favorite saying is it's never too early and it's never too late, and so I don't think it's ever time to say I can't change how I feel about myself. I think we can take charge of that and say I want to connect with others who start making me feel good about myself because in fact that will help us in terms of our careers and a happy life, uh, in our goals and also in our health. So it becomes a very important part of us. So Kitty, what are the steps that we could take to build a positive self-esteem? I think one thing that's very important is that many of us are there for other but unless we're also filled with being feeling good about ourselves, it's hard to give to other. So it's not a selfish thing to be positive about yourself, to think good thoughts. Um, the more that we do, the little steps that we do to take care of ourselves actually then make us um, better to take care of others. So as parents, we need to really make sure that we have a good view of ourselves, who we are, because that role models to our children then that it's okay to take care of yourself, that you are important and that you're very special and your health and so forth are related to how you think or view about yourself because you'll take the time for it. You know, I think sometimes we got to take little steps and sometimes those can be um, looking at um, positive affirmation. How do I look at myself? How do I say, can I say there's three great things I really love about myself? There might be things I want to work out, but can you say that about yourself? Uh, can you say that you're worth it, that you would take the time out to do things to nurture yourself, like exercise, eating well, and relating to others? And I think a lot of our self-worth comes from our interaction with others. I think it's hard to do in isolation, and so it's a very important and positive part of relationship to others. There's a field um, called psychoneuroimmunology, and basically what it says is we know that how you feel about yourself is so important that we feel it's related to your immunology system, it's related to your whole physical being. So more and more science, psychology, medicine, um, all these areas are realizing that the core to how um, effective we will be in our lives, our health and so forth, is related to how we see ourselves and who we are in our own minds. No one is an island. We all need support networks either within our family, the school, the community, or friends. <laughs> and of all of our relationships, it's probably our family relationships that are the most important. From when we're children, our parents play a vital role in developing our self-concept. And in turn, we do the same for our children. Jonathan caught up with Ian Grant, and they talked about just that, relationships within our families. Ian, how do family relationships contribute to our well-being and balance in life? I think they are huge. Um, like, for instance, in suicide, young people, I believe, commit suicide for one main reason. They don't feel connected. And the family is the best place to feel connected to. Uh, and I remember talking to a young guy, and he said, the only thing my parents make me responsible for is my pen. And, and so connectedness is very important. I remember talking in a, in a large Australian school, and the lady before me was speaking on drug-proofing your children. And her daughter, at 14, had snuck out on a Friday night, supposedly to go to a friend's place, gone into a nightclub in the city, taken an ecstasy tablet and died. She said to me in the headmaster's office, I'll be interested in what you're going to say, because we were a perfect family, I'm not being arrogant, look what happened. When I finished, she came up to me and she had tears in her eyes. She said, you've got to promise me, every time you talk about families, 
you must always share what you shared, that you sit around the meal table and you listen to what's going on in your children's lives and you ask them the what if questions. What if you found a hundred dollars? What if someone offered you drugs? What if? And I think she's right. I think she focused in on the two important things because life has become an airport for so many homes. Everybody's going off to exciting things. Now it's interesting, I used to do talks to senior officers in the New Zealand Police Force and they made an interesting point. They said, you know why they put a food hall in an airport? It gives the airport security. And uh, when people eat, there's a sense of security in that airport. It's just not a passing through of people. And I think, that I've never forgotten that point, and I think sitting around the meal table, listening to what's happening in your children's lives, asking them the what if questions, passing generational wisdom, and above all is giving them the reason what they believe. As I've said before, your actions come out of your feelings, you come out of your feelings, come out of what you're telling yourself, and what you're telling yourself is what you believe. And uh, that's very important to give your children a sense of, hey, my life's important, uh, I'm designed, I'm a created being, I have talents, I have gift, and the biggest thing is I'm listened to in this group of people. I have a place in this home, in this family. Would you say having a good relationship with your spouse is an important foundation for having a functional family? I say to men, you honour your wife because your, the, your children's view of their mother is what dad gives, and the view of dad is what mum gives. And so I think for couples, their relationship is important. I say, look, hug your wife in front of your teenagers. They'll go, that's a teenager's job description. But what they're really saying, isn't it great that dad still loves mum? I mean, he's a hopeless lover, but at least he's trying, you know? And so for couples, I think it's very important, you realise you need 10 minutes a day of focused time with each other. You basically empty the pockets of your day and you talk to each other. Now couples say, oh, 10 minutes, something. You think, how many couples really have that 10 minutes? Once a week you have a date doesn't have to cost money. Some people think $60. I always say, look, a divorce will cost you hundreds of thousands of dollars. In that date, one week you talk about finances, the next week you talk about your future, the next week you talk about the children, and the next week you just talk to yourselves. And then once a year you have a 48-hour retreat where you just spend time with each other. And we encourage, now this was mind-blowing for Mary and I, and we encourage this in our 48 retreat idea. You go for a walk for half an hour, half an hour there, half an hour back. Because women are relationship experts, they talk first. She tells you her whole life story, right back to where she remembers. You make no comment, you just listen. On the way back, you tell her your life story. And you don't comment for two days, you let it filter in your own. I had a new understanding of my wife, Mary, and I think she had a completely new understanding of me. And what happens in today's life, we are so busy being successful, we're not being significant. And I think significance is everything in a family. And dads are great, because dads know the three R's, rules, routines, and ridiculousness. I mean, dad's the first one who throws a baby in the air. Mothers would never do stupid things like that. See, the baby thinks, this is different, but it's exciting. So dads who come home late can often go into their children's room and say, quick, in the car, in the car. They say, why? Just get in the car. Oh, I have to wear my clothes. No, your pajamas do. The kids think he's taking me to the glue factory. He's going to melt me down. See, you drive out and you buy them something nice, a little drink or a snack. See, and as they, you say to them, what flavour do you want in your milkshakes? Vanilla or oh, banana? You know, when they drive out, your oldest kid will go, why did you do that, Dad? Because you're in my team. And crazy things you do with your children, tell them, I love you. So family relationships formulate a base for other relationships in life. Oh yes, if your children can express themselves around the, around the table, they learn how to communicate. We have an attitude um, book which, which covers the four things I think parents need to give their children. Attitude's everything. And it's a self to live by. In other words, the parent writes down six good things about their child and, and communicates to the child. Then a work to live for. Um, you know, you, we need to encourage children their creativity. Uh, I heard an expert say, your work should be, it's like traffic lights, it should be 50% green, you love it, 30% amber, I've got to do it because of my job, and 20% I hate this, but it's my job. And he said, if you get those proportions out, you'll have a nervous breakdown. And I've often thought about that. And then a faith to live by. We are spiritual beings 
we need to have our faith answered. And fourthly, a cause greater than myself that I'll die for. Because take youth suicide. If you have a cause greater than yourself that you die for, you'll never take your life for nothing. True friends accept us for who we are, what's and all. Times of crisis reveal who our truest friends are. They're the ones who stick with us when we need them the most. They join with us in trials and give us perspective to help us solve problems. They make great sounding boards for new ideas, for challenges and for personal crises. So we need to make time for our friends, even when we're really busy. Jonathan spoke with Vicki Bennett about the value of friendship. From when we were a little kid, when we were a child, we were always uh, involved in friendships. We were, also, we were always measuring ourselves in friendships and we always wanted to be friends. We were always looking for a best friend. I think that having some close friends in our lives is a great way to measure um, how we're travelling, the depth of how we're travelling, how we're feeling about ourselves. And it's important for us to have friends so that we can, I guess, use that mirror it for ourselves and others and, and to dip into that well of, of friendship so that our hearts can be rejuvenated. Our spirits, um, our souls, I think, rely heavily on our friendships with other people. It's a nurturing thing. Um, we give and we receive in a relationship. We give friendship to others and we receive it. I think we have to be careful about how we do give and receive in friendships. I think that for our health that we need to be both good at giving and good at receiving. We have to stop and listen and get feedback regularly in friendships. And I think one of the most important things we do in, in friendships is listen. How do we help our children develop healthy friendships? That's a big one because we want the very best for our children. We love them and we don't want them to get hurt. And yet if we don't allow them to develop friendships and learn the strategies to do that effectively, we haven't really done our job as parents. One of the stories that I talk about in, in my teenager's book called Life Smart is about a parent who takes on the, um, I guess, the stuff that the daughter comes home with in the afternoon about her friend Sally. And what happens, happens in families all over the world. The daughter walks in the house and Sally's upset her and she unloads to her mum. By the end of the, the story about what Sally's done, the mum's taken on all of the issues and feels quite angry about Sally and says, well, you mustn't be a friend with her anymore. She's obviously not a good person for you to be a friend with. The next day, the mum's still feeling a bit agitated but thinking, well, that's okay. We had a good talk yesterday and my daughter's going to be fine about it. So when she comes home the next day and finds that Sally's in the lounge room with her daughter, obviously having a marvellous time, things have been patched up and they're great friends again, she's feeling a little agitated because she took it all on. And I think that's something that happens to all parents. The most effective way that she could have, the mother could have handled that would have been using that reflective listening. And for, for, for young people, um, to develop friendships and for, you, for us as parents to help them develop friendships. The most effective thing that we can do is help them reflect their feelings, validate their feelings, um, say, well, what, what could you do next time? Next time Sally did that, how, how do you think you could deal with it more effectively? What are your choices here, darling? Rather than, oh, she's obviously not a good person because we're so resilient as human beings, we're great forgivers, we're really good at that. And um, we need to be able to forgive quickly and move on. And if we can be enablers for our children to help them to, to learn, forgive and move on, then I think we've done our job much more effectively. Apart from our family and friends, we also have a social life which extends out into our wider community. School networks, social groups, hobbies, sports and religious groups all have an impact on our social life and we in turn have an impact on society. 
Jonathan caught up with Reverend Tim Costello and they talked about the importance of community in our lives. Tim, does a sense of community relate to our well-being? Well, our well-being is totally determined on our experience of community. Um, sometimes if community is harsh, that means our mental and emotional health has suffered. Where a community is healthy, we will be healthy. You see, community is really a, a much overused word that really simply says a community is a group who shares a common story. It might be the common story of a religious faith, of a sporting group, of a locality, of a family. And when that common story is a story we uh, cherish, that inspires us, that gives us commitment to one another, then we will have good health. If the common story has been of abuse, has been of denial, has been of treachery, that community will actually harm us. So with, when, when you ask about wellbeing, it's really dependent on us experiencing ourselves in a healthy community, knowing there is support, knowing there is a commitment to keep nourishing us and nourishing it. How do we build a stronger community? We build a stronger community through commitment. That's what it takes. Um, and commitment means having time to be there for one another, to read each other's needs, moods, to serve, to celebrate, to laugh and love. Um, what we find in this culture is people want to be free of restraint, free of commitment. They uh, define themselves increasingly as competing individuals who say, my only duty to anybody else in the community is to do whatever is in my best interests. I don't want to be tied down and have to serve. That's the opposite of commitment. A healthy community, by contrast, is made up of people committed to one another who choose those, those restraints, who say real freedom will actually be in being there for one another and committed even if I might want to run. Given that relationships are so important to our well-being, how then do we go about enriching them? Well, according to Gary Chapman, you have to be in the driver's seat in a relationship, actively working to improve it by learning to listen, to resolve conflicts and to love. Gary, relationships are an important part of life, but there's something that we don't always succeed in. How do we go about building positive relationships? Well, Jonathan, I think that's the real question. You know, the fact is we are in relationships because we are relational creatures. The question is, are we going to have good relationships or poor relationships? I think there's several things in building good relationships. Uh, number one is learning to listen to people. If you don't learn to listen, you're not going to have good relationships. And by nature, most of us are not listeners. We're talkers, you know, let me tell you. Uh, so I think we have to learn how to listen. And there's lots of skills to be learned in listening, such simple things as eye contact. You know, you're looking at me, I'm looking at you, I have the sense you're hearing me. Uh, so there's a lot to be learned in, uh, in listening skills. I think that's a big area, learning to listen to the other person. Uh, I think another thing is learning how to handle anger. You know, anger is a pan-human emotion. Everybody feels anger. And I think it's because we have a sense of right. And when our sense of right is violated, we feel angry. So if we don't learn how to handle anger in a positive way, and many people have not, then we're not going to have good relationships because mismanaged anger will destroy relationships. I think another factor is uh, learning how to love, which means you put other people's needs above your own needs and you're thinking in this relationship, what can I do to help them and to minister to their needs? Whether it's physical, emotional, spiritual, we're reaching out to that person. And I think if, if we don't make love a basic theme in relationships, then the opposite happens. We make ourselves the center of the relationship. And no relationship will flourish as long as I'm foc focusing inward. And my idea is, how can you meet my needs? Now, yes, I have needs, and I certainly hope those will be met. But I must take the initiative if I want to build good relationships by reaching out to other people. There are other things, but I think those are three fundamentals of good relationships. In fact, in relationships, almost always, we would like the other person to change. If they would do a few things differently, we'd have a better relationship. That's in my mind, okay? But if I want that to happen, I don't do it by demanding that the other person change. I seek to put them first, reach out to them, learn how to minister to them. Then I can make a request. If you think I really love you because of my behavior and I make a request, you're far more likely to respond to that request. I think in formal education, we don't do a lot 
to give people help in relationships. I think there are a lot of sources. One is books. You can learn a lot about relationships in books. Maybe that's why I write books. <laughs> I think also attending classes, classes that are held in community settings or church settings that uh, deal with relationships. And uh, most churches and community organizations are doing that sort of thing. And so I think you can learn a lot in going to a workshop on relationships. I think also we learn by observing other people particularly bad relationships. <laughs> you can learn something, you know, from a bad example, and you can say to yourself, I'm not gonna treat people that way. So I think there are many settings in which we can learn. I found, Jonathan, I've learned more about relationships when I'm meeting in a small group and we're look, using some material that relates to some aspect of relationships and we're discussing it with each other and talking about our failures and our successes. I personally have learned more in that setting than I have a lot of other places. And I meet a lot of people, Jonathan, who have accomplished wonderful things vocationally or in the world of finances, and yet they say to me, I'd give it all up if I had it to do over, and I'd spend more time with family, with friends, essentially building relationships. So I think it really is true that relationships should be the top priority for all of us. And if we don't take time to relate to people, all the other will eventually become very meaningless. One of the most important ways we relate to others is through communication. It's how we convey our thoughts, our passions and our ideas to another person and how we hear from them. Now, if we can communicate effectively, we'll avoid misunderstandings which get in the way of developing really good relationships. <laughs> Jonathan spoke with Gary Grant about this very topic. Gary, communication is important in relationships. Is it something that is inherited, modelled or learned? Actually, it is a little bit of all of those. And the important thing is, is that when you think about it, is we can't change a family, we can't change the, the quality of our, our upbringing, but we can, in fact, it is a skill, communication that we can acquire. From your experience, what are the most important factors in effective communication? Well, there's actually three, Jonathan. I think they're in, in, in this order. One would be the non-verbal communication. That includes not the words, but it's the gesture or posture or stance or, or facial expression. The second one that is incredibly powerful is the tone of voice, not so much what we say, but how we say it. And the third one is the content, what we're actually trying to communicate. And so of all those three, the content is the one that lends lesser of an influence to the meaning of the communication. And yet, unfortunately, it's the one that most people would see as the major contributor. We need to really slow the process down, listen very carefully while the other person is, is speaking. The other person has to be very concise in what they mean and not make it a personal threat. And then we need to check the accuracy before we move to the next stage of communication. When we don't feel connected with our society, things are more likely to come unstuck, like increases in suicide, addiction and relationship breakdowns. Shared values and a clear moral framework hold our society together. And for each of us individuals within that society, our values and morality add meaning to our lives. Richard Eckersley believes there's a void in our lives caused by a lack of connectedness and an unfulfilled need to belong. What's striking about the research on health and well-being is that when you look at a wide range of, of evidence and uh, uh, research fields, the thing that, that comes out strongly is the importance of belonging, identity, meaning to health and happiness. And all these things uh, tend to be related, but certainly um, relatedness, belonging is a critical part of, of people's well-being, uh, both in terms of physical and emotional and mental health. Um, for example, people with strong social networks uh, die at, at uh, a half or a third the rate of, of people with only weak social networks. 
in, in some of the research I've been doing with a national well-being indicator, we've found that marital status, as an, as an example of relationships, um, has more than twice the impact on how satisfied people are with their lives as, uh, say, income, differences between rich and poor, or age, differences between uh, young and old. And so right throughout a wide range of literatures, uh, uh, aspects of relatedness, um, personal, social, spiritual, um, the balance between them uh, turn out to be absolutely pivotal to people's uh, health and well-being. How in today's society we've created an empty self uh, which is stripped um, of of uh, community, uh, tradition and shared meaning and is in a sense fundamentally disappointed with itself uh, and to compensate for that um, we, we need to continually be filled up with sort of um, consumer goods and celebrity gossip and, and sort of uh, personal development programs and so on. So similarly the Canadian psychologist Bruce Alexander writing in the area of addiction research has spoken about what the, the thing that's most important to people is what's, what he called psychosocial integration, which is the individual's uh, sense of belonging to a group and being accepted and understood by the group. Um, he says that modern societies instead promote psychosocial dislocation um, because it has, has taken people away from traditional sources of personal, social and spiritual belonging. And the result of that, he says, is that people attempt to get a life by creating substitute lifestyles. And, and substitute lifestyles, he argues, um, often center around addictions of one sort or another, where we, we um, focus on one or a few aspects of life to the detriment of a more balanced, um, healthy way of life. One of the things that uh, has been interesting in my work as a researcher in this area, that, that often I find that everything comes back to our values, uh, issues of, of virtue and vice, if you like, which is kind of ironic. It's not the sort of language that uh, um, uh, scientists normally use, and uh, is that the virtues are really um, aimed at, at building and maintaining strong and harmonious relationships at a number of levels and the strength to endure adversity. Vices, on the other hand, are about the unrestrained satisfaction of individual desires and needs and the capitulation to human weakness. And it's a very unfashionable thing to talk about, but essentially without a clear moral framework, it's very difficult to know what to do in life, what to believe, you know, what's important and what isn't important. So values are very important to a sense of personal empowerment, um, a sense of control over your own life, being in charge of your own destiny. So historically, you know, the, the values that have been promoted have really been about encouraging a sense of belonging at a number of different levels. One of the striking things about our modern way of life is the extent to which it has reversed vices and virtues and vice versa. Materialism, for example, which is attaching importance to money and, and things, um, is, is, is associated with not greater happiness, but in fact less, with things like lower life satisfaction, more depression, more anxiety, poorer personal relationships and so on. And likewise, we see a similar association with individualism. Um, individualism and materialism are probably two of the, the, the strongest defining characteristics of, of our modern way of life. Um, individualism, unlike materialism, has good and bad aspects to it, um, but essentially what it does is involve placing the individual self at the centre of a framework of norms and beliefs and values, which um, while, as I said, it has some positive features encouraging self-esteem and a sense of personal control and optimism, also tends to isolate the individual uh, from these networks of belonging that are so important to health and well-being. And I think that one of the critical ways in which we have got individualism wrong in our society is that it is in confusing autonomy with independence. Our spirituality can sustain us and have a powerful and positive impact on our well-being. One of Australia's leading social commentators, Hugh McKay, spoke to Jonathan about how undertaking a spiritual journey can add meaning and purpose to our lives. 
the great value of what people now call the spiritual journey or the inward journey is that it, it encourages us to define the meaning and the purpose of our lives, to clarify what our values are, what we really believe in, what values we really want to espouse, how we really want to live. Now, all of those things contribute to our sense of meaning, our sense of purpose. They, they arise from, for some people, meditation, for some people, religious practices or spiritual discipline of various kinds. But the object in every case is to achieve a kind of central still point where we're confident about why we're here, what kind of lives we want to lead, what the purpose, the goal of those lives is. And in that way, of course, we move beyond the material. We move into the realm of non-material values, which give us a deeper sense of confidence that doesn't depend on what we own, what we have, but depends more on our confidence in who we are and why we're here. So, and there's plenty of evidence that however you do it, the striving to nurture the spiritual dimension of your life has positive health benefits, not just the obvious psychological benefits of things like more optimism, more confidence that you know why you're here and why you're leading the kind of life you're leading, less fear of death, for example. People with religious faith uh, report that. But also people who've nurtured this spiritual aspect of their lives, just in medical terms, turn out typically to live longer, uh, to experience lower levels of blood pressure, uh, to experience a generally healthier uh, way of life, less depression, uh, less stress, and a much lower incidence of suicide. Now, for some people, who express their spirituality through ritual, uh, through working in a spiritual communi uh, community with like-minded people, there are, of course, other benefits. There are enormous social benefits from being part of a group of people who are on the same journey. The sense of connectedness with people who are also striving to define some meaning and purpose for their lives, that can have a very nurturing uh, uh, effect for us, but also some of the religious and other spiritual practices, disciplines, rituals, even things like singing communally. People experience an enormous health benefit uh, from the experience of singing in choirs, corporate singing. One of the great psychological advantages of maintaining this spiritual quest, being on this inward journey, is that it does give people a stronger sense of who they are a greater sense of wholeness. And when people begin to experience that, it's not just a selfish thing. That actually enriches the quality of their relationships with each other. It's much easier to enter into a relationship when you know who you are. Much easier to be part of a couple or part of a family or part of a small community if you're perfectly capable of standing on your own two feet emotionally and psychologically and being alone. I mean, one of the things that most people who are interested in spirituality finally recognise is that you do need some solitude. But what that solitude does for you is to enrich you, to clarify your sense of meaning and purpose so you can bring a heightened confidence to your other relationships. You're not as easily hurt. You're not as easily confused. You're more confident in taking initiatives in relationships and more confident in dealing with conflict more confident in dealing with the inevitable uh, confusions, arguments, disagreements that will occur in any relationship. And also, when you have that greater sense of wholeness that comes from clarity of meaning and purpose in your own life, it's much easier for you to withhold judgments about other people and to be more forgiving of the flaws in other people. I think one of the things that the saints, the mystics, uh, the spiritual leaders through the ages have always come to is a sense of their own frailty as humans, a sense of their own deep flaws, which makes them feel in harmony with the rest of us because we're all deeply flawed. And one of the things about spiritual strength is that it gives us the capacity to be less judgmental and more forgiving people who know that the ultimate resource is within them and in the quality of their closest, most intimate personal relationships know that it doesn't really matter if the world is falling apart around them. They still have the hope 
the confidence, the optimism that, that they can live because they've given their lives the meaning, the purpose that allows them to do that, almost regardless of what life throws at them. Relationships are an integral part of our health and balance. They sustain us through times of stress and bring meaning to our lives. For physical, emotional and spiritual well-being, we need positive relationships on a personal, family, social, community and spiritual basis. So invest time in your relationships at all levels. Jump in the driver's seat. Actively improve and enhance your relationships. Thanks for listening to us today. Yeah, and thanks to everyone who had a hand in making this program. Thank you for your time and sharing your experiences. And we wish you the best in finding and maintaining positive and nurturing relationships at all levels of your life and getting connected. I'm Kylie J. I'm Alan David Lee. Good luck with taking charge of your health.